All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. So it's been a little while since I last posted a video, and probably needless to say, life has been a bit busy here lately. And over the last month and a half, uh, at least here in the United States, we have really been dealing with this new novel coronavirus. And in many ways, our lives have been completely changed as a result of this little virus that we see right here. So many areas around the world, and even throughout the United States, have really faced one of the most challenging periods of time, certainly in any of our lifetimes, and definitely one of the most challenging times that we've probably seen in 100 years in this country. And so initially, I do want to apologize for taking some time away. I hope that you guys understand. But really, for the past four weeks, I've been putting in 50 to 60 hours a week at work, and just did not have the time or the energy to be able to get on here and make a video. So, given that it has been so long since I last made a video, I wanted to really kind of loop back around to that initial coronavirus video that I did back at the end of January. January 29th is when I did that video. And I really wanted to kind of give a quick update on where we are today in relation to this virus. And so, over the last few weeks, because of what we've been facing with COVID really around the world, a lot of attention has been drawn to the last series that I completed covering the respiratory system, non-invasive ventilation, and vent modes. This channel now has over 30,000 subscribers, and I really want to thank you guys. I've received so much support on those videos that were out there, and a big welcome to so many of you guys that have subscribed to this channel in that time. Your support has really meant a lot to me, and it has been so humbling to see how many people just around the world have found these videos to be useful and helpful to them given the current crisis that we're facing. And if everybody that is now a part of this community, uh, I really hope that the videos that I continue to put out moving forward will be ones that you guys do find value in. And so for those of you who are new here and don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. So like I said, I want to kick things back off and I just want to really take a quick dive in and take a look at where are we today in regards to COVID-19 and especially comparing this back to January when I did that previous video to really kind of see how much things have changed. Uh, obviously, I think many of us are well aware of this, both in our personal and professional lives, how much things have just completely changed for all of us. But it's very interesting when I sat down to look at the numbers and kind of compare it to where things were before, how much of a difference we've seen. And so to start out, let's really take a look and see where are we now in regards to this virus. And to do that, let's first take a look at the worldwide cases. So the latest numbers at the time of this recording, which is early in the day on April 20th, 2020, we can see here that the total number of cases that are confirmed throughout the world are almost 2.4 million cases. Now again, to really just put this in perspective, back at the end of January when I did the last video, the total number of confirmed worldwide cases was only 7,800. So just a substantial number of new confirmed cases. And certainly these, these numbers are probably even higher than this because so much of this is based on our testing ability and those who have sought treatment or sought testing. And a lot of places around the world from third world countries to even here in the United States where we really aren't testing that many people. So certainly I'm sure these numbers are, are a lot higher than what we see here, but even just the, the magnitude of change that we've seen in this in not even three months is just crazy to think about. Now for the number of deaths that we've seen worldwide as a result of this coronavirus, we're now at almost 165,000 people that have died. And again, just looking back to January 29th, the death count at that point was only 170. Really just seeing these numbers side by side is, is quite surreal to see how much things have progressed over such a relatively short period of time. Now one interesting thing on here is that of the almost two and a half million cases, 615,000 of those have recovered. So this means that the people have completely recovered, they've tested negative, but what really kind of sheds a light on some of what we're dealing with is even if we add this with the number of people who died, we're still only looking at about 800,000 people that have reached the end point of, of either unfortunately passing away or fully recovering from this virus. And so what this tells us is around the world, there's still more than a million and a half people that are currently dealing with this virus right now. Just sobering numbers. 
Now, those are the numbers around the world. I do want to take a quick look at the numbers here in the United States. And now here in the United States, when looking at all the other countries around the world, obviously we have a very large country, but we currently lead the world in the total number of confirmed coronavirus cases. And we're almost at 765,000 cases. Again, just to really put this in perspective, back in January in my last video, do you remember how many cases there were in the United States? Believe it or not, there were only five at that time. Now, the current total for the number of deaths that we've seen in the United States so far just passed 40,000. And again, the time of the last video, there were nobody in the United States that had died. And what's really crazy about this virus here in the United States is we really didn't start seeing cases spreading within the community until almost the end of February. And so, so much of this, so much of what we've seen has really just happened over about the span of two months. Now, again, looking at the number of recovered here in the United States, we have 71,000. But again, if we add these to the deaths, it's only 110,000 people, a little over that, that have sort of reached that finality with this course of the virus. And so we have another 650,000 people in the United States right now that are still actively dealing with this virus. So now that we've looked at those numbers, let's take a little bit of time to talk about this virus and the pandemic that we're currently dealing with. Now, back when I did the previous video, this virus is something that we simply referred to as the novel coronavirus 2019. But now we actually have a name for this virus, and the name of this current virus is the SARS-CoV-2. And this is specifically the name for the virus itself. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is what actually causes something that we refer to as COVID-19. And this is the actual disease that you get as a result. Now, with this virus, we know that it originated in Wuhan, China, really before spreading to the rest of the world. Initially, we saw places like Italy, Iran, and South Korea that were the first next major hit areas. Following that, we saw the virus flood into Europe, and then shortly after that, we saw the spread into the United States and really throughout much of the rest of the world. Now, here in the United States, in terms of our progress with dealing with this virus, we're generally about two weeks behind Italy. And as we all know, Italy, especially the, the northern parts of Italy, were hit incredibly hard with this virus and just saw some absolutely astonishing things coming out of the northern parts of Italy in terms of what they were dealing with with this virus. But for us here in the United States, we've seen a lot of similarities to what has been happening in Italy. New York City here was hit quite hard, along with some other areas that are also dealing with some real struggles with this virus that in some ways mimics somewhat of what we've seen in northern Italy, whereas the rest of Italy and a lot of the, the United States really have not been as overwhelmed as we've seen in New York City and Northern Italy. But because we lag two weeks behind them, we can really see the numbers that are coming out of Italy and use that to help to project where we're going to be going here in the United States. And so I do want to bring up a, a graph of some of the numbers that we're seeing out of Italy. And on this graph, we can really see that exponential growth that they were experiencing, which obviously led them to completely lock down the, the country, again, mimicking very similar things that we saw here in the United States. The one thing to really keep an eye on, though, is as they reach this apex, the downward slope of this decline in the number of daily deaths has been not as steep as what we saw in the incline. And so I think what we're probably going to see as a result of this is instead of reaching our apex and this being the halfway point for the, the total number of people who end up dying from this disease, I think we're actually going to see quite a bit more people who ultimately end up dying on the tail end of this disease. And this is something that we really should keep an eye on here in the United States and tracking our numbers and seeing if this is going to be a similar type of graph that we're on. Now, we'll kind of look at some of the, the graphs here in a minute as far as what we've done, what we've seen around the world and here in the United States. But generally here in the U.S., I believe in most areas, uh, they feel like we've probably reached or perhaps surpassed the apex. And that was right around 35,000 to 40,000 deaths that we saw. So if we see this elongated tail of the death slowly tapering off, I'm really fearful that we might continue to see the effects of this disease for quite some time and really leading up to some some pretty significant numbers. Now, obviously, in response to these numbers that we were seeing, this incredible growth that we saw with 
the coronavirus, which I'm actually going to link to a video down in the lesson notes here. And it's a really good visual representation. It's a video that takes a look at all of the pandemics that we've seen around the world since the year 2000. And one of the big ones that's included in here is the swine flu. Now, in this video, overlook some of the ominous music that's in there, as really the point of this is to, to show you the, the steep incline and the rapid growth of fatalities that we were seeing with coronavirus and why this really triggered so many countries around the world to, to go into the lockdown that we've seen, because I think it was very clear very early on the magnitude of what we were facing with this virus. So again, that link's going to be down in the notes. Uh, if you guys are interested, watch it. I think it's a really good representation of the data and how we were seeing those numbers climb so quickly. Now, as a result, we ended up locking down, closing down, really putting social distancing in place, and even making the recommendation and requirement in some areas for masking of the population while out in public. Because of this, we've seen things where we have no school, bars are closed, restaurants, concerts, sports, mass transit in some area that the airlines have taken a hit, cruises have been stopped, even things simply like getting together with a group of friends and playing bridge, poker, really are not in line with the social distancing that we need in order to get control of this virus. And so we've asked people to, to wear masks while out in public. And really the point of this isn't to protect ourselves, but if everybody is wearing masks, we're helping to prevent that outward spread, limiting the aerosolization, limiting the spread of droplets. And this isn't just for when you're sick. This is for anybody out in public because you don't know if you're going to be an asymptomatic carrier or even a pre-symptomatic spreader. And in fact, some of the, the numbers that we've seen come out suggest that 25 to 50 percent of people may be asymptomatic but still able to spread the disease. My big takeaway from this information and some of the numbers that we were talking about, this clearly is not the flu that we're dealing with. I know we hear this all the time, it really makes many of us in healthcare cringe when we hear people say this because they, they just don't understand what it is that we're up against. And to see these numbers, to see the level of fatality that we've seen while having so much of the world in lockdown, it's really disheartening and disingenuous to try and minimize what this is by saying that this is just the flu or that the flu is worse. This absolutely is not the flu. Now we've done so much of this lockdown and social distancing, one really to save lives, but two, the main thing that we're looking to try to do is something that we call flatten the curve. I'm sure all of you guys have heard this. It was something that was being talked about nonstop weeks ago with our goal in mind of instead of having this massive influx of a significant number of patients, which again, we saw in places like Northern Italy in New York City, which can then overwhelm the healthcare system. Our goal is to slow down that spread so that we stay within the limits of what our healthcare system can contain, hopefully buying us time to have better treatment, possibly develop a vaccine. And if we look at some of the graphs of our cases and fatalities around the world, we can see that we're beginning to do just that. Now, both of these graphs are in a logarithmic scale, which really helps to show that flattening of the curve. And what the logarithmic scale means is that each line on here is simply a factor of 10. Like here, for example, we have 10 deaths, 100 deaths, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. And the logarithmic scale, if you see an increasing slope in this scale, we know that we have exponential growth happening. The steeper that slope, the greater the exponential growth. What we hope to see is over time that that slope begins to become flat. And so if we actually look at the total number of cases worldwide, obviously we had this very sharp increase when things were starting in China, and then we began to flatten the curve. But then as we saw the rest of the world, the virus taking hold, we again saw this increasing slope. But as you can see, we're starting to come down. We're not flat yet, which again tells us we still have exponential growth, but we're getting closer in line, which means the things that we're doing are working. We're getting there. We just need to give it time. Now, the deaths tend to lag behind the actual case counts that we have. So that's why we, again, are starting to see a decrease in our slope here, but it's not quite as flattened as we're seeing in our case counts. Counts, and over time, we should begin to see that mimic what we're also seeing in our cases. Now, we also see similar things if we take a look at the graphs of the United States. And again, we can see where we had that 
pretty good incline, that exponential growth where cases were growing really quickly. But now here you can see, I do still think I see an increase in there, but it's significantly less than what we were seeing before, which again is a sign that what we're doing is working. Same thing goes in our total deaths here in the United States. We see that initial sharp increase, and we're beginning to see that flattening of the number of cases of fatalities in the United States. So this is really good information, really positive signs, seeing these numbers trending down as opposed to the rapid increase that we were seeing just a month ago. So I think one of my big takeaways is that we are doing it. We are flattening the curve. And so it's really great that we're seeing this. And so just some of the numbers to kind of put it in perspective, what these numbers actually mean to us in terms of our hospitalization. Right now we're seeing of the confirmed cases that we know of, we're seeing 12 to 18% being serious and requiring some sort of hospitalization. Now, a little less than half, so about 5 to 6% of all the confirmed cases are what we refer to as critical and require care in the ICU. Now, to put this in perspective for you guys, around the country, we have about 6,000 hospitals, which give us a total of about 900,000 hospital beds spread throughout the country. Of those 900,000 hospital beds, we have about 45,000 ICU beds. Now, when we look at the number of people that are requiring ICU care, five to 6% really doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a pretty significant number compared to a lot of other diseases and viruses that we deal with. And that's where some of the biggest strain from this virus is coming from, even outside of some of the really hard hit areas, just the significant amount of ICU beds that are being required. Now, part of the reason why we were so quick to flatten the curve, just to put this in perspective, in the United States, we we're on a pretty significant incline on that logarithmic scale as we were passing 100,000 cases. If we would have continued at that trend and reached a million cases pretty quickly, five to 6% of a million cases is 50 to 60,000 ICU beds that would be required. Now, as you can see, with only 45,000 ICU beds around the country, this becomes a problem. Every single bed and then some throughout the entire country would have to be filled with just coronavirus patients in order to make this work. And as we know, based on what we saw in New York City and Northern Italy, things aren't spread evenly around the country. We see areas of increased activity, these hot spots as we refer to them, and we have the ability to significantly overwhelm the hospital system, again, exactly like we just saw in New York City. To see some of the images and the videos, to hear the stories from our friends who are there working, it just is absolutely mind-boggling to think that in the year 2020, in one of the richest countries in the world, in one of the richest cities in our country, that we faced a complete overwhelm of our healthcare system. And that was the big threat with this virus and why we acted the way we did. And part of the issue too is if we reach this hospital capacity, then we start to see an increase both in mortality of the patients with COVID, but also mortality in other patients because we still have people getting the flu, people still get in car accidents, they have babies, all of these require beds, and a strained healthcare system is only going to decrease outcomes that we see. We saw examples of this again in northern Italy, where some of the hard-hit areas and hospitals had to turn away people to other hospitals because they didn't have room to treat anything other than coronavirus patients. In New York City, we saw similar things where EMS was given the guidance of attempt to resuscitate people for 20 minutes where they're at, and if you don't get ROSC and you don't get them back, don't bring them into the hospital because they weren't able to deal with that additional capacity. We also around the country have seen people who just haven't been seeking care for things, which ultimately we're going to see an increase in mortality as a result of that as well. So the big takeaway from this here is we're on the right trajectory. We're beginning to flatten that curve. We've really staved off in most areas a complete overwhelm of our healthcare system, but we have to continue doing what we're doing. We aren't there yet. We haven't reached that point to say we have won the battle with this virus. And so that really kind of segues into the next thing I want to talk about here, which is our reopening of our economy and our country. Now, one thing that has really been taking place over the last couple of days here in the United States are these protests of people all around the country, including here in Arizona, where I live, where people are wanting to reopen the economy. They're wanting to reopen their lives, get out of this lockdown and continue about their daily lives. And I 100% get where they're coming from. This is such a difficult time. We've seen record unemployment numbers just 
beyond anything that we've ever seen before. And so there really truly is an impact of the lockdown that we've done, but we've already put it into place. And if we open up too early, we run the risk of doing all of this for absolutely nothing. And one of the points I try to make with people all the time is if we had done nothing and this virus had just gotten way out of control, do you really think that the economy wouldn't just shut down on its own as people didn't want to venture outside and go do things? I really think we were going to face this either way. And so to be able to do this early enough or try to do it early enough to minimize the cases and try to get a hold of what's happening with the hopes of earlier being able to open back up and do it effectively, that that was our goal. Now, one thing I did find very interesting is in all these videos and pictures that I saw the protest, you hardly saw anybody wearing a mask and almost no social distancing going on. So these same people who are demanding that we reopen and saying that we can do this voluntarily aren't even taking the basic necessary precautions to keep all of us safe. And the other thing too is we have cases that are still ongoing in a lot of areas. We're flattening the curve and we're beginning to see the decline, but there are still cases happening in areas where cases are still increasing. The recommendations out there is that for areas that want to reopen that we really should see 14 days straight of declining numbers before we even begin a phased approach of reopening. And the president has outlined a plan for a phased reopening. California and other locations, New York City and the the states surrounding that area have, have also put plans in place to do this phased reopening. But really the big question is, is it going to be successful? And I really question that based on what we're seeing out of so many people at these protests. Are we potentially going to see a second wave when we reopen. What happens then at that point? Do we lock down again? A lot of unanswered questions, and we're just at that tipping point to really see what we're going to be doing as a country. Now, in order to have this successful reopening, we need massive testing. They're saying that we need to be doing, just in the United States, 500,000 tests a day, which we're currently only doing 150,000. So we're going to have to see a significant increase in our testing capacity, as well as we're also going to need to see source tracking on an unprecedented level. We have to be able to find these positive cases, identify them, and then source track everybody that they've came in contact with to test and quarantine those people as well. We're also not anywhere near that. There have been talks of antibody tests and antibody tests that are being developed or in production and currently being used. There was a sample test out of California that showed a pretty high number of people that were testing positive with antibodies but were not known cases of coronavirus, which certainly suggests that there's more people in the population that were infected and just don't know it. This could be promising news, getting us a little bit closer to herd immunity, although we need significantly more numbers of people to be infected in order to to reach that point without a vaccine. And it's important to know that with this study that it was a very limited study, and it's far too early to take this one study and draw conclusions for the entire nation based on that study. It'd be interesting to see in New York, they're preparing to begin what they refer to as massive antibody testing, and we'll see some of the numbers that come out of there. But we know we had a pretty significant amount of infection going on in New York, and especially New York City. The other thing too is we're just not sure what the presence of this antibody really means for our immunity. In South Korea, they've been reporting about 2% reinfection rate. And we don't know if this is a problem with their testing or truly these people are being reinfected with coronavirus. But there also was another study, and I wish I could find the link to it again, where they talked about measuring the level of antibodies. And they saw of those people that had a known coronavirus infection, the level of antibody that was present in their body was significantly lower than what you would expect for them to have immunity against this again. If this study is true, and this is is really what we're seeing, it leaves a lot of concern for the efficacy of a potential vaccine, where if we had people who got a full-on infection from this virus and didn't develop enough antibodies to fight a new infection, if we were to give an attenuated version or whatever the vaccine might look like, would this even provide enough level of antibodies to resist an infection? So there's a lot of unknown questions, things that we hope to find out over time. So much of this is is so very new and we're really kind of learning as we go. The other thing to look at too is we're hearing out of a lot of states around the country, especially in the areas that weren't hard hit by the virus, where they're wanting to restart to some capacity elective surgeries and elective procedures because really outside of some of the ICUs, the rest of the hospitals don't have the volume that they used to. 
a lot of empty beds, a lot of staff in procedural areas who aren't getting hours and aren't working. So there certainly has been a significant impact to those hospitals. And I know a lot of places are looking at what does that reopening look like for the hospital? Now, I know myself, uh, probably many of you guys and many other people really worry that we might be reopening too early and we could potentially see increases in cases again. Here in Arizona, we're not currently overwhelmed with cases, but at my hospital, we do have a good amount that's really pushing us near capacity when looking at our ICU. And so if we here at my hospital and a lot of the other hospitals around the country from what I'm hearing are in similar situations, if we see an increase in business from opening elective cases, Cases, and we also see a, a new rise in cases from reopening our economy too early, we could really see a lot more hospitals in areas not hard hit having trouble dealing with what we're facing. So I think this is one of my biggest concerns that's out there. Now, to finish out here real quick, I do want to just real quickly get into some clinical information and quickly cover some things that we have learned or that we know about this virus. Some of this stuff I actually am planning to do more in-depth videos on, as well as some other topics specifically relating to COVID and the care of these patients or how we really function in this world of in ever-increasing demand on our ICUs and our critical care services. But just to kind of hit on a a, a few kind of key points that we're seeing around the country and really around the world with these patients. So one of the big things is early recognition of our increasing oxygen requirements. Now, as we've seen, these patients can really turn quickly. And as a result, we have a low threshold for admission into the ICU because we want to be able to recognize this early in these patients, get them into an environment where if they do deteriorate quickly, that we have the resources, that we have the training in place to be able to take care of them. Now, when it comes to intubation, there's really mixed information out there. And again, this is something that we just don't have enough data on to have a solid understanding. Some areas, some hospitals are really delaying intubation, while in other areas, there's a lower threshold to intubating some of these patients. To go along with that, we also have mixed information coming out on the outcomes of our patients who end up on ventilators. Some areas are seeing really bad outcomes where once patients end up on a ventilator, most of them are not making it off alive, whereas other areas are seeing better outcomes and reaching a point where they are able to get they are able to get a decent amount of people extubated. So again, very early to kind of know what some of these factors or changes or different variations in physiology or disease pathophysiology that's leading to that. The other thing too that we're seeing is that high flow nasal cannula may be a good option if we're looking to try to avoid intubation. But in most cases, we tend to be trying to avoid therapies like BiPAP because it's aerosolizing. The next big thing that we're seeing with these patients is proning. And I'm making this in all caps because it's such a big thing. These patients oftentimes are responding well to proning. The earlier we do it, the better, and even awake proning these patients before they get intubated. It's so very interesting because we see so many of these patients that really can benefit from this proning where in the past, proning has almost been a salvage therapy or, at least in my facility, something that we might try first before we go to ECMO or we might do if they wouldn't be a candidate for ECMO. But now we're seeing so many of these patients, almost every single one of our patients in the ICU were manually proning. And as a result, normally we would use the, the big massive rotoprone bed, but we just don't have enough of these beds. And given the, the volume of these patients that were proning and the early therapy in proning these patients, it just makes sense to do it manually. And that's what we've been doing. And again, we're really seeing the benefit of this in our patients. One of the things that we see going on with these patients too is the cytokine storm. We're seeing this take place in these patients, and I know there's a lot of people looking into other similar pathologies of diseases to explore treatment options or management options, but this is something that we have identified with these patients. We're also seeing a component of microemboli within the pulmonary vasculature. Now, there are thoughts, too, that we might also be seeing a similar thing in other small vessels around the body, and we're really not sure of the etiology of what's causing this just yet, but we are seeing some approaches to early anticoagulation that may be beneficial in these patients. Now, next I want to talk about our treatment. 
Unfortunately, at this point, we still have no known treatment available. There are many studies that are taking place, both looking at the hydroxychloroquine, as well as remdesivir, and also other drugs or other things that we think might be benefiting these patients. Now, I did see a thing today talking about the first results out of a New York study looking at the hydroxychloroquine. The early results should be being released or published today, so we'll see if we're beginning to potentially see any benefit there. And just the other day, an early study when looking at remdesivir was beginning to show potentially some promise. Now, they didn't have any control arm, and they were really just looking at whether someone gets 5 days versus 10 days of treatment, but out of the 125 patients they had in there, 113 were severe illness, but most have been discharged at this point, and only 2 had died. Again, early in the study to know that this is an effective treatment, but it potentially gives some hope that as numbers continue to come in, if we continue to see results like this, that this might be a potential treatment option for these patients, which would be absolutely amazing. Now, the last big thing I want to talk about when looking at the clinicals of taking care of these patients is it's really important that you remember that we need to adjust the way in which we operate today. And really what I mean by that is, in the past, we would rush right into a code. We'd immediately intubate someone right where they were, right where they're at when they need it. But first and foremost, you need to protect yourself. You need to make sure that you have the gear on that you need first. You need to ensure that you're in the proper room if that's something available for you to move into a negative pressure room. Then you can proceed to do what needs to be done. And I understand that this is so difficult sometimes to come to terms with in terms of how we've dealt with our patients in the past, that we would drop everything to jump right in and immediately try to help them. But unfortunately, with this virus and this disease, that we risk not only getting ourselves sick, but potentially facing serious outcomes as a result of this. And therefore, it's absolutely important that we also protect ourselves while also trying to do the best that we can for our patients. A really great example of this comes out of Africa when looking at the Ebola epidemic. It takes five to ten minutes to put on all the gear and to put it on properly in order to enter the Ebola room. Regardless of what's going on with that patient in that room at that time, it still takes five to ten minutes to put on the gear. And so it's important that we also understand that and have that same mentality today when dealing with this virus. And so most importantly, you guys, keep fighting the good fight. We're all playing our part in something much bigger than all of us and helping with something that only happens not even once in our lifetimes, but once every hundred years. This is truly something that we're facing on a grand scale. And so make sure that you guys protect yourselves and that you stay safe. Godspeed to every single one of you guys. And I will see you here soon with another video. You guys have a great day.